My name is Richard Godfrey, CEO of Bergen Bio, and it's my deep pleasure to welcome you to our reception this evening. I'm joined this evening by members of our executive team, also our principal investigators, scientific collaborators, and KOLs. This evening we're going to introduce you to Axel Biology and some of the groundbreaking work we're doing in understanding how inhibiting Axel can help patients with aggressive cancers and other diseases. We have a broad phase two program working with Bemcentinib, our first in class Axel inhibitor, and collectively presentations around the room will introduce these studies and some of the data to date. Thank you for your attention, enjoy the presentations. So, um, so I'm the warm-up back for the remainder of the, of the PIs that will be uh, presenting the, the clinical trial results that we, we have to date. But I wanted to just give you a, a quick overview of the poster that is on this, this section, uh, which represents a number of the, our thinking about the role of the axle receptor tyrosine kinase uh, in cancer. And so we've been working on Axel for many, many years in my lab and around the world. Uh, and, and one of the most remarkable aspects of Axel is that it's, it's, it's invariably correlated with poor overall survival in cancer patients across a whole number uh, of different solid malignancies and myeloid leukemias. And we've worked, we and others, and have been trying to understand uh, the basis for that. And a, a consensus is, at this, at this stage, is that Axel is an important regulator of, of two key compartments in tumors. Uh, on, shown on the upper right here in, in, in uh, green is the role of Axel in regulating the innate immune response to tumors. And on the right is the, uh, shows the role of Axel in regulating uh, survival programs in, in tumor cells. And it's actually this understanding that's led us then to translate uh, those, uh, that understanding into, into the clinic. So on the left side, you'll see that, that Axel is associated with, with a, a um, immune suppressed microenvironment, in particular uh, in macrophages and NK cells and also some dendritic cells. And its role in general is to suppress uh, the, the immune response. Uh, it also, uh, on the right, Will, will regulate so-called uh, tumor plasticity uh, related to, for example, epithelial to mesenchymal transition. And it's actually this, this crosstalk which we think is very important uh, in driving tumor re drug resistance and immune evasion. The axial receptor tyrosine kinase has a, a single ligand, GAS6, which you'll hear probably more about in the posters. In general, though, the, the, the role of axial in normal physiology is limited. It's an important regulator of, of, of uh, inflammatory diseases, as we'll hear from, from Dr. Hogeboom. Uh, we're now able to, to measure the, the expression of axial in tumors using uh, new uh, IHC methodologies. And what we can see as, if, for example, on the bottom in this non-small cell lung cancer section is expression of axil both in the tumor cells but also uh, in, for example, adjacent alveolar macrophages. So in targeting these, these two uh, compartments, as uh, shown by our colleagues for, uh, from UT Southwestern, uh, Dr. Rolf Brecken, and he has a poster here, uh, can take you through that. Uh, we see that we can derive benefits from, from selective inhibition of Axel, uh, which you'll hear more about. Thank you very much. I'm Matthew Krebs. I'm an investigator at the Christie Hospital in Manchester in the UK. Um, so first of all, thanks very much, Bergen Bio, for the opportunity to be here. It's a, a massive pleasure to be involved in this program um, and a great pleasure to be able to present this poster on behalf of all the investigators involved. So um, I'm presenting to you the, uh, presenting to you the bemcentinib uh, plus pembrolizumab in non-small cell lung cancer. Uh, this is for patients in the second line setting uh, post-platinum-based chemotherapy. It could be for patients who are either uh, positive or negative for pdl one so it's quite nice to recruit to. We know the landscape of lung cancer treatment is changing, but at the time this was recruiting, it was quite nice to be able to recruit patients who are pdl one negative. Um, and also it didn't matter if they were axle positive or negative, so we could look at that retrospectively. 
Um, uh, all patients needed to have a fresh tumour biopsy, so we could see the updated status of PDL1 and Axel at the time they go on to chemotherapy. We know that Axel become, can become upregulated as a resistance mechanism to, to chemotherapy or to uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitors. So, really important we got that biopsy before they went on the study so we could see what had changed uh, in the Axel expression compared with the original diagnosis. Uh, I won't tell you too much. Um, uh, we encourage you to come along to the poster and, and ask questions. I just have to give you a little, a little teaser. Uh, but there have been 22 patients recruited so far. Um, currently, the study is, as, as planned, will be on hold so we can see the outcome from those patients before we recruit the next batch of patients in the next stage. Uh, we've got a response rate of uh, around about 20% um, as an all comers. And if you look at the PDL1 negative patients, the response rate seems to be a bit higher, albeit it's uh, small numbers of patients so far. We've got a nice case study on here. We've got some nice PD data from uh, soluble uh, circulating biomarkers. So I'd encourage you to come along and have a look at the data. Thanks. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Oldbjorn Straume. Um, I work at the uh, Haukland University Hospital in Bergen in Norway. So what I have uh, brought with me today to present to you is um, an uh, investigator-initiated trial uh, uh, with bemcentinib in combination with um, standard of care treatment for melanoma, that is immunotherapy or MAP kinase inhibition with dabrafenib and trametinib. So uh, if you come and visit me at the poster, I'll go through the design of the trial because it's a little bit complicated, but it's not... It's not that bad, and I'll show you some early response data and uh, some CT scans, and, uh, and we'll also be able to discuss our biomarker program that we are very proud of. We have a very broad biomarker program. Uh, we uh, aim to find predictive markers uh, for response to these combinations. So uh, um, the trial is... Uh, hypothesis generated. It's um, based on the research done by Jim Lawrence and his group. And uh, uh, it's very early data. Uh, we started including patients uh, only one year ago. So it's too early to, to say anything very con conclusive, but uh, I can show you some details about the trial and what to expect from this trial and what we can use to try this trial for uh, in the coming years. So thank you. So I'm David Gerber. I'm a professor at the University of Texas Harold C. Simmons Southwestern Cancer Center. And today I'll be discussing our phase one trial combining bencetinib, the Bergen bioaxyl inhibitor, with docetaxel chemotherapy for previously treated advanced non-small cell lung cancer. And just by way of background, um, while immunotherapy and targeted therapies have seen a lot of attention and enthusiasm in recent years for this disease, the reality is, is that almost universally our patients progress on both of those therapies and require treatment with chemotherapy. And the main chemotherapy drug that would be used at that point is a drug called docetaxel. It's given intravenously every three weeks. It's approved for previously treated metastatic non-small cell lung cancer, and its response rate in this disease is generally less than 10%. So that is fewer than 10% of patients actually achieve meaningful tumor shrinkage with this approach. Why combine bemcentinib with docetaxel? There is preclinical data showing that of all of the classes of therapies that may enhance the effect of that class of chemotherapy, axle inhibitors are at the top of the list, with some preclinical studies showing a thousand-fold increase in preclinical efficacy. The way we designed this trial was with a staggered initiation. Patients come on study after their prior treatment and they receive a week of bemcentinib before starting the docetaxel. This design allows us to accomplish two things. First of all, we know that during the loading period, the first three days when there's a higher dose, that patients are more likely to have toxicity from bemcentinib. 
by having the chemo start after that period, we lessen the combined toxicity. But equally important, with a staggered initiation, we're allowed to determine the pharmacodynamic effects of each drug alone and in combination. And what we've seen so far is promising. I will tell you this treatment is not without toxicity. We have seen some decrease in white blood cell count. But when you look at the efficacy, and I know it's too early to draw conclusions, instead of seeing fewer than 10% of patients respond, of the first seven that we've been able to evaluate for tumor size after starting, three of them have formally responded. Now we can't draw conclusions, as I've said, but this is a very promising avenue for us. And if we continue to see a trend like this in this early trial, I would certainly be encouraged to consider moving this forward into a larger randomized study in the future. What have we learned about the biomarkers? Well, the biomarkers take two forms. There are some tests that we look at after we start the drug. And when we see changes in protein in the blood after starting bemcetinib, some of those changes, such as increased thrombospondin, mirror the changes that we saw in the preclinical studies showing us that we're having a similar biologic or physiologic effect. Have we identified any tests or biomarkers that we can look at before starting that might help us decide who's most likely to benefit from this combination? Again, it's very early, but as you can see from this figure, for this particular blood-based biomarker, levels certainly appear to be different in those patients who are going to respond compared to those patients who aren't. This is an example showing you just how long a patient can have response. We've had patients on the trial now for more than six months. One of our patients, unfortunately, had to stop treatment for several weeks. He did so not because of toxicity or progression, but because of logistical issues. And during that time, he could not come to our center for treatment. During that time, the tumor grew. He, again, was able to come back to UT Southwestern after almost two months. We started him again on combination therapy, and it again shrank the cancer. So we're very excited about this combination, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Richard, thank you very much for the invitation to be here. It's a very big pleasure for me because I've been following the role of Axel in acute myeloid leukemia now for some years, and um, it's very rewarding to now be the investigator um, on the BGB C003 trial. Um, and we have just completed the phase one part of the trial in which we treated 35 relapsed refractory elderly, non eligible for intensive chemotherapy, acute myeloid leukemia patients and also um, high-risk MDS patients. And I'm very happy to say that the drug was very well tolerated. And this was a very elderly, heavily pretreated population with a mean age about 74 years. And I'm very happy that we observed very good tolerability, so we did not see any grade four side effects and we saw some responses. So the response rate in AML was 23% and in MDS, 43%. And now I'm very excited that we also discovered um, a potential biomarker. Of course, the numbers are still small, but what we see is that um, if we stratify patients according to the biomarker, we can double the response rate in acute myeloid leukemia, meaning that patients expressing low levels of the biomarker um, have a much higher chance to respond. And this also fits with the biology. And then second, I'm quite convinced that the GAR6 axle Plays, axis plays a very important role, especially in the bone marrow, where it also inhibits anti-AML immune responses. And yeah, we are also following this up further. So if you have any questions relating to the trial, then just pass by the poster. And yeah, thank you very much. I'll begin by thanking Virgin Bio for the opportunity to come and speak here tonight. Uh, it's certainly a pleasure to be standing in front of a group of oncologists talking about a a relatively rare disease, but some of you may have encountered it. And uh, I'm going to tell you about some of the data we've been generating of late 
uh, around uh, axle gas 6 TAM receptor biology in the context of idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. Uh, so I I've been given a little bit of time here to explain what the disease is before launching into the data. So uh, very briefly, IPF is a, a chronic, irreversible, and uh, incurable lung disease. Uh, it starts with scarring or stiffening of the alveolar lung tissue uh, that impairs oxygen exchange. Uh, we're not advancing anymore. There we go. So IPF sufferers feel like they're uh, actually breathing through a coffee stirrer. IPF kills the same number of people uh, every year as breast cancer, but has uh, a lower five-year survival rate. And in fact, if we look at uh, some rather dated uh, uh, data at this point, uh, the five-year survival uh, rate here for IPF is certainly much worse than, than many of the cancers that are shown here. Now, just to put this into to some context, if we were to consider uh, IPF versus uh, a, a much more common pulmonary disease, that being chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, IPF is really like uh, COPD's bigger and deadlier brother in that if COPD is an elephant on your chest, then IPF is really the entire herd. It is uh, considered an orphan drug indication and uh, really based upon narrow estimates, uh, the U.S. prevalence is between 14 to 63 cases uh, per 100,000 population, which translates into upwards of 90,000 IPF patients. Uh, and uh, there's an incidence of about 50,000 uh, new cases a year. Uh, other estimates peg it at uh, the prevalence being slightly higher. Uh, close to 200,000 cases, but either uh, using this narrow or broad estimate approach, you can see that it's certainly an orphan drug uh, indication. It mostly affects the elderly, and it's heterogeneous in its presentation. Uh, it, it's certainly idiopathic in that we don't know the, the risk factors, or uh, we don't know what's causing IPF, but risk factors are thought to include uh, smoking, environmental exposures, chronic viral infections. Uh, many, if not all, of these patients show abnormal acid reflux, and uh, there are uh, patients that show a family history of this disease, which we refer to as familial IPF. Now, the patient profile is as such, uh, the male to female ratio is about 1.5 to 1. The age of presentation is typically in the sixth decade of life. And uh, there is usually a fairly prominent smoking history, upwards of 70%. Uh, some other key features to bring to the forefront is that uh, this disease uh, is unpredictable in its course. Uh, diagnosis still remains uh, a big challenge, uh, requiring the efforts of radiologists, pathologists, as well as pulmonologists. And uh, these patients do suffer from comorbidities, including COPD and pulmonary hypertension. Uh, we don't really know what's driving the progression in this disease, and this has been a, a major question in, in my laboratory over the years, but in uh, approximately 50% of these patients, uh, uh, death is seen within two to three years of diagnosis, and this is uh, in part due to the lung becoming stiff and shrinking, uh, thereby leading to uh, the ability of these patients to breathe and uh, physiologic measurements, including forced vital capacity, bear out the, uh, uh, the severe problem that these patients are having in, in breathing. So this 50% uh, mortality rate after diagnosis is seen within two to three years. Now, if we look at estimated deaths from various chronic respiratory diseases in the US now, uh, we note that all chronic respiratory diseases appear to have maxed uh, recently and, and are sort of on a downward trajectory. This is in part because of the signal uh, seen in chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. But if we look at interstitial diseases and include uh, other uh, rare diseases, including pulmonary sar sarcoidosis, uh, the trend seems to be continuing upward. Now, prior to 2014, the, the IPF tr uh, treatment landscape was rather bleak. 
the listing of, of drugs that, that have been tried uh, included corticosteroids, uh, various types of immunosuppressants, as well as uh, N-acetylcysteine. Uh, as you can see, there was minimal, if any, impact on disease progression, uh, mostly symptomatic relief, but certainly nothing that uh, provided any benefit in terms of slowing uh, the progression of this disease. And that all changed, though, in the, in the fall of 2014 when profenadone was approved here in the United States by the FDA. And uh, this drug then was shown to uh, not only uh, reduce mortality, but also had a, a major effect on uh, uh, forced vital capacity. So uh, what we note here is that there was uh, a 47% reduction in the proportion of patients uh, with a decline in FEC on drug versus the placebo control group. Now the adverse events that, that patients on preventadone complained about were uh, largely in two categories, one being GI involving nausea and the other being uh, a skin rash. Now also that year, the, the FDA uh, approved another drug. Uh, it's also used in oncology. Some, many of you may know of this drug. It's an intenative. It's a intracellular inhibitor of, of multiple tyrosine kinases, although they describe it as an angiokinase inhibitor. Uh, many, if not all, of the secondary endpoints were not achieved, but there was uh, an effect uh, on mortality and a, a more modest uh, improvement in forced vital capacity in, in the, the group that received an intentative versus uh, placebo control. Uh, adverse events uh, included uh, many GI problems, including uh, diarrhea. So since the, uh, the, the launch of these two drugs in the United States, the, the IPF market now approaches nearly 1.5 billion, uh, and, the, and that exceeded analyst expectations by over 700 million. And certainly, you can see that the, the, uh, the sales of approved IPF drugs are expected to, to move upward, approaching 2.5 billion by 2020, if not sooner. Now, the, the major question might be, you know, is there any more space for uh, therapeutics in, in this disease? And what I need to do is backtrack a little bit here and explain how uh, patients are typically stratified into three GAT categories. Uh, based upon forced vial capacity. So uh, the IPF patient segmentation is briefly summarized here, uh, but patients fall into this mild category when their forced vital capacity uh, is uh, relatively mild in that there is a, a, a very mild defect in uh, FEC. Uh, they fall into the moderate or, or the severe categories, again, based upon uh, forced vital capacity characterization in that percent predicted uh, can fall uh, below even 24% uh, in those patients that show very severe disease. Uh, it's important to keep that in mind when we consider that it's really the moderate to severe IPF patients that need therapeutic options in that nintenidib and profenadone uh, show uh, effects uh, in the clinical trials and in ongoing studies of these drugs in patients with mild uh, and, and a certain proportion of the moderate patients uh, with IPF. So the way we interpret this is that there is a significant unmet medical need and this might represent upwards of perhaps 50% of IPF patients. So enter uh, GAS-6 TAM receptors and the importance of uh, this uh, pathway in uh, IPF. And I I'm showing you some unpublished data from a study at the University of Michigan while I was there in 2011, in which we looked at, at transcript levels for Axel in uh, peripheral blood samples from IPF patients. And there were some very interesting trends here in terms of uh, the axle high group showing uh, increased mortality and also uh, the inverse relationship between GAS6 expression and TYRO3 expression with respect to uh, lung uh, met, uh, physiology parameters including forced vital capacity and diffusing coefficient of carbon monoxide. Just recently, uh, we have published uh, many of these data in the American uh, Journal of Respiratory and Critical Care Medicine, but I just want to 
point out some of the, the highlights from our study around uh, the exploration of, of GASX and Axel uh, in the fibrotic mechanisms driving idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, and in particular those patients that show this moderate to severe phenotype. So when we looked at, at GASX Axel transcript in activated protein expression in IPF lungs, we noted that there was certainly a group of patients that showed uh, tremendously high uh, transcript levels of both GASX and Axel. And note that I'm, this is a, a log uh, 10 scale that I'm showing you here. Now, when we explored diagnostic biopsies from the, the patients outlined in red, it was immediately evident to us that there was a very strong uh, si protein s a signature for Axel and, and Tyro 3, but not for MER-TK. And indeed, when we looked more closely and quantified uh, P axel expression, uh, again in these patients with severe IPF, uh, in this case based on, on how quickly they progressed in disease, again we saw that there was a, a significant increase, uh, marked expression of phosphorylated axel in these patients with uh, severe IPF. Now our, our strategy at that point was uh, a multi-pronged one in which we utilized both in vitro as well as in vivo studies and employed uh, uh, biologic small molecule inhibitors as well as the multi-kinase uh, receptor inhibitor, Nintenitib, also known as BIBF1120. And, and really our approach here was to uh, look at both IPF and normal fibroblasts that have been isolated from patients with this disease and explore uh, the biology of these cells uh, when we're manipulating uh, the GAS6 axle or multiple tyrosine kinase uh, uh, receptors. Uh, well, I'll also sh sh briefly touch on and show you some data from in vivo studies uh, that uh, give us a, a clue as to how IPF fibroblasts might be de uh, driving disease. And this is done in the context of immunodeficient mice. And then finally, I'll show you data from a bleomycin-induced uh, pulmonary fibrosis model. I uh, also need to point out that uh, throughout this study, an uh, interchange, uh, these designators, uh, R428, uh, BGB324, and bemcinonib, uh, clearly this, these are all uh, synonyms of the same compound. Now, first and, and most striking to us was that the small molecule inhibitors of the TAM receptors, rather than the biologics that we had in hand, uh, were most effective at modulating IPF fibroblast activation. And this was noted in the context of TGF beta stimulation, looking at uh, collagen uh, generation by uh, IPF as well as normal fibroblast stimulated with TGF beta in vitro. Uh, we also noted that uh, with extended treatment that is extending for a couple weeks in vitro, we noted that uh, we were able to attenuate many of the matrix uh, components generated by uh, these fibroblasts, whereas the biologic in this case had no effect. And then finally, and, and most exciting for us, was the fact that uh, uh, targeting uh, Axel with a small molecule approach in, in BGB324 uh, substantially inhibited the uh, activation of fibroblast progenitors. So these SSEA4 expressing cells are the cells that give rise to the pathogenic fibroblast that we detect in these patients. So uh, R428 or BGB324, but not this uh, biologic S6, reduced transcript expression of profibrotic genes and the numbers of SSEA4 positive cells. So the ability of a, of a, of a therapeutic to target the synthetic properties of, of these cells is interesting, but really uh, from the standpoint of, of what distinguishes severe from more mild or moderate disease, uh, there is an aspect of fibroblast behavior that is now just becoming uh, of interest, and that is the invasive properties of these cells. And the way we explore that is, is through the use of a, of a, a, a fibroblast functional assay. Uh, in the room will be very familiar with this uh, process of, of looking at the invasive properties of, of tumor cells when they're in a, a mesenchymal state. But this assay really provides us then with the ability to uh, monitor in a very specific manner 
the ability of our, our various approaches, whether they be biologic or small molecule, to attenuate the ability of both normal and IPF fibroblasts to invade in tissues. So in this case, we're looking at the relative wound density as a percentage. And you'll note that uh, for R428 was very effective in inhibiting the ability of these uh, uh, pathologic fibroblasts to invade through matrix, whereas the biologics had no effect. I'll just quickly move on to uh, the in vivo data. Uh, in this case, I'll, I'll just show you the data from a GAS6 deficient mouse challenged with uh, bleomycin versus its wild-type counterparts. At the day 14 time point where we uh, conducted this analysis, uh, we noted that Axel, MERTK, and GAS6 are increased at the transcript level. Uh, but more importantly, with the absence of GAS6 in this mouse model uh, following bleomycin challenge, there was a, a significant reduction in a bio biochemical measure of fibrosis, and that being hydroxyproline. Now, a model that uh, we developed a number of years ago, and, and also uh, a model that uh, would certainly be very familiar to all the oncologists in the room, and that is the employment of, of these human cells to humanize immunodeficient or skid mice. And in this context, we've noted that the introduction of IPF fibroblasts, but not normal lung fibroblasts, leads to a reproducible uh, and maintained fibrotic response uh, in these mice. So once these cells are infused into the mouse, they, they distribute to various organs, as one can imagine, after an intravenous injection. And yet it's only in the, in the lung that we know these cells driving any kind of a fibrotic process. So in this in vivo study, uh, after the cells were injected, we began treatment uh, with the TAM uh, receptor inhibitors uh, or with uh, nintenative or BIBIF1120. And our analysis then was at day 35. So why uh, would we focus on day 35? Well, it was really at that time point where we saw the uh, increases in both GAS6 and Axel at the transcript level. Uh, it did show up a little bit earlier at day 21, but the, the, the fibrosis was, must, was most evident at that day 35 time point. Targeting with uh, these inhibitors then uh, altered the uh, uh, expression of a number of markers of fibrosis, including hydroxyproline and platelet-derived growth factor uh, receptor beta, and we also noted that uh, targeting uh, Axel with R428 uh, significantly reduced uh, the phosphorylation of Axel and did have an effect on Tyro3. And then finally, uh, from this in vivo study, I'll just highlight that uh, we noted that uh, targeting with uh, the small molecule approach uh, and not with BIBIF uh, led to an attenuation in, in the uh, fibrosis in these uh, humanized mouse lungs. So I'll quickly summarize, and, and I appreciate your patience as you've allowed me to, to go through uh, these data. Uh, clearly, this is a, a new area of investigation for us, and uh, we're very excited with uh, the data we have around uh, the expression of GAS6 Axel, uh, the phosphorylated version of Axel, as well as Tyro3, uh, particularly in this uh, subset of IPF patients for which we don't have uh, adequate treatments now, uh, namely the, the severe IPF patients. So targeting uh, TAM receptors with bemcenative abolished uh, both uh, synthetic as well as the functional properties of these primary lung fibroblasts in in vitro assays. And then uh, more importantly, we've extended this now in vivo uh, with the targeting of, of GAS6 and TAM to show that we're able to ameliorate fibrotic processes in an in vivo model of IPF. I'll just briefly uh, thank uh, members of my lab, including David, Malena, uh, Ana Lucia, and Miriam, uh, for their uh, help in, in generating these data and moving this project forward. And uh, finally, the funding sources uh, from the NIH, as well as from Cedar sinai where I'm situated now, University of Michigan, where I was uh, located for a number of years, uh, as well as Virgin Bio. So again, thank you for your, your patience, and I'll be more than happy to answer any questions for you. Thank you.